here because we get to deal with apocalyptic texts like this one. How do we relate that to uh, where we are in our world and our life? And so I want to begin, uh, I guess, by relating uh, the passages that can be read to you from Mark 13, 1 through 8, by saying that uh, fear and worry is a part of the human experience. Uh, we all do that. Uh, it doesn't matter how old we are. We all fear things. Uh, fear is a constant companion on our life journey, and you may have known that through your years. Uh, teenagers, uh, you worry about your future. Uh, what are you going to do uh, when you graduate from high school or college? Uh, young adults worry about finding this perfect partner in life. You worry about a career that's going to bring meaning and purpose uh, to you. You worry about debt, those who have massive college debt and who haven't had enough years of earning money to pay for the things yet. Uh, Middle-aged adults worry about being happy and satisfied. I read a poll uh, this week about what are young adult or what are middle-aged adults most worried about, and it was happiness. Older adults worry about their health naturally. We worry about being safe. We worry about being loved. We worry about our finances. We worry about our children. We worry about our spouses being faithful. We worry about our football team winning the football game. We worry about the weather or another mass shooting that we hear on TV. We worry about declining numbers of people attending our churches. We worry about being right with God when nothing seems to be right in our life. So, church, we are human because fear is our companion in life. And so, over the years we turn to Scripture, to see, to seek inspiration. And scripture tells us that our ancestors worried and they were fearful just as we were. The stories that we hear remind us of the need to be persistent and courageous in the face of our experiences in life and the fearful times in which we live. So in today's reading from the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is coming out of the temple, and here is uh, this model that was exactly built according uh, to the uh, temple that Jesus knew uh, that King Herod built. Uh, one of the disciples turns to Jesus and says, Teacher, look. Stones are. Look at this massive building. The disciples have a reason to be impressed because this building was one of the ten architectural wonders of the ancient world. In order to impress the Roman Empire and his friend Caesar Augustus, King Herod undertook this vast project to build a grand, massive temple on a temple mount, an expanded temple mount in the city of Jerusalem, and it began in 20 uh, B.C., about uh, 14 years, 16 years before the birth of Jesus. And the project took 80 years to build, 80 years it took to build this massive temple. And there's a lot more, you'll see uh, larger uh, expanded uh, photos of this Temple Mount. But this, uh, this temple, outside of it, was decorated with 40 foot high walls that stood, uh, uh, or its <coughs> walls were 150 feet high, excuse me, and that's 10 to 15 stories. Just to kind of get an idea. Uh, larger than most of our downtown buildings uh, here in Lincoln. The east 
censer in front of the temple was uh, plated with gold. And so uh, it was built with white marble, and with the gold and copper, it glistened in the Middle Eastern sun. Uh, and it was constructed on the highest point in the city of Jerusalem. That's why they called it Mount Zion, which is meaning the Temple Mount. And so when people, when pilgrims were journeying from the, the villages uh, to Jerusalem, they saw this massive building, and it inspired them. The disciple who reveals uh, to Jesus the grandeur of the temple thinks that it's going to last forever. Why not? Archaeologists not too long ago found a single foundation stone from this temple that measured 40 feet in length, it was over 10 feet tall, 14 feet thick, and it weighed 500 tons. So when you have a building built of those foundation stones, why wouldn't you think it would never fall? It was too big, too grand. But Jesus, uh, as he's walking out of the temple with his disciples, doesn't see the building that the disciples see. Jesus startles his disciples with a prediction that these great stones will one day fall. And Jesus knows his beauty and magnificence won't last forever. It's probably written in the time of the Gospel of Mark. Mark was written in the time in which this building fell, in which Jerusalem, the city, was burned. So Jesus and his disciples uh, return to the Mount of Olives, where they always go after they visit the temple. Uh, and they gaze from a distance at the temple, and the disciples must have found Jesus' words pretty troubling as they looked across in Jerusalem. Jesus doesn't really oppose what the temple has become. Jesus opposes uh, what, the what the temple symbolizes in the life of the people. Because it's lost its soul. It's lost its purpose. It's lost its, its sacredness or holiness in that it's no longer a place of prayer for the people. It no longer takes care of the poor and those who are oppressed as the king and the temple is supposed to do. And Jesus will visit this temple three times uh, after chapter 11 in Mark's Gospel. And Jesus doesn't worship or pray, but he surveys the temple and then he returns back to the Mount of Olives at night. It seems that Jesus is a bit angry at the corruption and that the temple no longer functions as a gathering place of God's people, thousands of people at one time, to hear about God's love and God's compassion. Instead, it becomes a place of foreign occupation, of chief priests serving Rome. It's become a place of stiff taxation, of corrupt business, and a place where the rich have taken advantage of the poor, and many of the priests are leaving the temple and going east. Because they no longer can see the temple as a place. So in this story, I think Jesus is trying to teach us what matters. And what matters is, you know, things look impressive on the surface sometimes to us. But when, when we get beyond the surface, then things may not be so impressive on the inside. People are like that too. Jesus reveals to us a deeper insight. And Jesus isn't impressed by the silver and the gold and the white marble, but Jesus is more impressed with humility and service. And the temple has lost that. Our world is always changing. There are, yes, wars in
in our world, and earthquakes, and droughts, and ravaging floods, just like these apocalyptic texts tell us. We have monster hurricanes, and we have devastating forest fires, and there's sickness, and there's unfortunate tragedy that breaks our hearts. And Jesus, as well as we in our own day, know what it means to be a fearful. And so, always at the end of the church year, the scriptures present us with the apocalyptic texts that talk about the end times. And in these passages are descriptions of disaster and destruction upon Jerusalem, mostly. But sometimes uh, the, the world at large, they, they describe things coming apart. And Israel felt things were coming apart under the harsh rule of the Roman Empire. And the Gospel of Mark will describe us, describe to us just that. But there is a button here, okay? In the time of upheaval, in the time of coming apart, in the time of the end, there is also a beginning. Is T.S. Eliot that, that made that fabulous quote, in the end is my beginning, and I use it in every funeral service that I officiate. In the end is my beginning, because it is a circle. There is no end or beginning. There are always birth pangs after ends come. There is always a new creation that waits to be born. And Jesus prepares his disciples and followers in every age, and even you and I, for that which is about to be born. We're always about the work of, of establishing something new, a new creation, a new transformation. Rebirth and hope are the ways of God, not death, not destruction. Yes, there is that. But it's not the end. At the Regional Assembly in Nebraska City this week, we heard three great messages about the church. About the church, the Christian church, the sign of the Christ in Nebraska. About the church at large. And those were great messages about how we walk together as a church. And how we celebrate the gifts of all of our people in the church. If affirmed in our annual meeting today, the congregation is going to begin a three-year journey called Building a Vision for the Future. And yes, like the Jerusalem temple that needed to be fixed, there, there are some things we need to fix up here in our place. Like any house. The congregation, uh, or the, the the building, this building, has served the congregation for 132 years. This building was built on the, the destructive layers of the first building that was destroyed by fire in 1928. But this place has stood here for 129 years. The people, the church, I mean. And we have, we, we, we have met here for 129 years for worship. We've met here to be taught and we meet to sing and we serve together in the name of Jesus Christ for 129 years. And when times have been rough in people's lives, when, when tragedies have rocked our world and our, our hearts and left us in fear, this is a holy space that we have come to. Trying to get to hold each other and to lift each other up. Because hope is always reborn in this place. And this place is always alive with fresh possibilities and new life. This place is a place of welcome and sanctuary for people who need support and counsel along the journey. And this is a place where we come to the table to be fed and where we in turn feed.
feed others through our table in the food pantry. And so we've implemented this vision to take care of our house so we can continue this fine ministry in this sacred space and that we can encourage each other in the midst of all the changing circumstances of our lives. We are not the church of the 1950s. We are not the church of the 1920s and 30s. We are the church of the first modern world in 2018. And we celebrate this church that we are a part of in this day and this time. And we go forward with vision. We offer an opportunity for you to become a part of a, a movement that seeks to be a place of fullness and healing in a world that sometimes can be troubling, but also uh, in a world that brings us much joy. Won't you come and be a part of that 